This is Athens Unpacked. I'm Sofka Zinoviev, and in a series of podcasts, I'm continuing my long quest to understand this fascinating city. Athens Unpacked is made for This is Athens, the official visitor's guide to the city. Each time I put together an episode of Athens Unpacked, I wish I had a whole series just for that subject, and never more than this time. We're looking at songs and poems, and I've had to be highly selective. I'm leaving out classical music and more generic pop music. The focus is on song as a quintessential form, and how it's connected to poetry. We'll also see how older musical traditions inspire contemporary bands. We're starting off with rembetica. It's sometimes referred to as the Greek blues, perhaps for its association with poverty and outsiders, also for its apparent simplicity. To discuss rembetica's influence on popular music, I'm going to meet Lisandros Falireas, he is the co-founder of the fusion band Imam Baldi. Your band plays music that's an amazing mix of old and new, Greek and foreign, and it's popular in Greece and all around the world. Can we start with the name of your group, Imam Baldi? Why did you choose to call it after a delicious dish of aubergines? The name came because this process of making music has many things in common with cooking, because you mix different ingredients. And sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't, like in cooking. My brother and I, we cook a lot. So it came naturally. It's a dish that's very common around uh, the Mediterranean. You can find it in, in different versions in Greek cuisine or Turkish cuisine or, let's say, uh, Northern African cuisine. Our music is too, it's very Mediterranean in a way. And it literally means the imam or the priest fainted from, from it being so delicious. Yeah, from eating, from eating too much. So <laughs> he fainted from pleasure. So it's a, it's a, it's a good uh, connotation. <laughs> And you and your brother, Orestes, you began the band with the idea of using or remixing inspired by Rembetica songs, is that right? Rembetica is kind of the, the emblem of the Greek music of this time. And maybe you could argue that it, it's, it's the most important style for the development of Greek music. Rembetica came out of the arrival of the refugees with the catastrophe. So that brought in a whole new culture, didn't it? Well, um, Rembetica, in a way, it's a child of, uh, of the Smyrnaiko songs. Smyrnaiko means the song from Smyrna, nowadays called Izmir. It's on the Asia Minor coast, so the coast of uh, Turkey uh, on the Aegean Sea. And um, it was a melting pot of civilizations of like of Greek, Jews, Turks, Arabs, also Western, you know, people from Western Europe. And then when the refugees came to Piraeus in the 1920s, they brought this culture with them. So Piraeus became a melting pot of cultures. <laughs> And there was a whole underworld associated with Rembetica, with the, the mangas, the tough guys and drugs and this sort of thing, which had a big impact on the music, I think. Yeah, of course. You have to imagine that these people were very poor. They were living in shacks all around Piraeus. And they would sing, you know, it was a very simple song in a way. They just sang their daily lives and their daily lives was, you know, all this, uh, it was drugs and prostitution and uh, poverty and obviously, you know, love affairs and all that stuff. So there was a crossover that on the one hand, Rembetica was kept marginalised for a long time, but then after the war, there was a kind of emergence of going to the bouzoukia. Yeah. What happened is that uh, composers like um, Tizanis, they took the song and, you know, started 
changing it in a way and it became a bit more open to a wider specter of the society and it was more accepted in this way it became not as harsh as the rebetico also the recordings gradually became a bit better so all this uh, led to what we call laiko songs which means popular To get an idea, here's a song by Tsitsanis, one of his most beloved, Cloudy Sunday, Sinefiasmeni Kiriaki. Sinefiasmeni Kiriaki. Mnyasis me tim gardiam. And then later on in the late 60s and 70s, composers made it even more open. So like all, I would say that the main influence is the Repetico song, but it's much more Western, if you like, much more easy to listen to, and the lyrics are not as harsh. You would never hear a song about like a guy shooting uh, heroin, like you would do in a Repetico song. This is an example of a laiko, or popular song. It's sung by the wonderful Marinella, and it's called Drop by Drop, Stalia Stalia. It's mostly about kissing. Sandros was giving me a whistle-stop tour through 20th century popular Greek music, and I was curious about today's big bouzouki nightclubs. They're hugely popular in Athens and worth a visit. The programme starts around midnight, and you can throw flowers and dance on the tables till dawn. I wondered who Lysandros would identify as their glossy stars. Now Mazonakis is one, you know, a big name. Adonis Remos, Paola. Some of it is a bit more trashy, but not not all of it. But there's also nice stuff happening there. Uh, but okay, it's it's very commercial. It's a bit kitsch, but nonetheless, sometimes you have great fun. You know, it's it's entertainment. <laughs> That was a clip of Andonis Remos, one of Athens's most successful singers. His style is modern, but the bouzouki's still there. What's so interesting is how elements of old Rembetica get passed on. You can hear this in many songs by Imam Baldi, Lissandros's band. Let's listen to an original version of an old song by Manolis Chiotis and then the reworked version by Imam Baldi. It's called Passatembos, which means both a casual pastime and roast sunflower seeds eaten to kill time. The singer laments, I understood that for you I was a little passatembos, or pastime. <laughs> So you've named your group after a Turkish dish and all throughout Greek culture we come across these different elements whether it's Greek coffee or Turkish coffee, whether it's baklava, the syrupy sweet, or mezedes, or dolmavas. There's so much in every aspect, especially of domestic life, that makes us think of swap between the two cultures. But it's also been a tricky yeah. relationship. I'm just thinking about how a while back when both Turkey and then Greece had some serious earthquakes and there was talk of earthquake diplomacy. <laughs> and I'm just thinking that your band Imam Baldi and the way it refers to Turkish heritage through its name, through the food, it's almost like bridging the gap in musical terms. In music, there was never a barrier. 
When I first lived in Greece as a student, I was introduced to the music of Hadzidaikis and Theodorakis. Their beautiful songs opened up so much of Greek culture and language for me. A singer who has worked with both composers is Eli Paspala, and I was thrilled when she invited me to her house in northern Athens to talk about them. Eli, I first saw you singing in 2002 at a celebration for Nelson Mandela when he came to Athens, and I just loved your singing and have followed your career ever since, so it's a great honour to be here with you. You were brought up in New York but you've worked with some of the greatest Greek composers and songwriters. How did that happen? Well, first of all, um, it's a pleasure to have you here, and thank you so much for your lovely, kind words. Yes, I was born and raised in New York. My parents were both Greek from Thessaloniki, and I was brought up listening to two very, very important composers who were very, very active at the time when I was a child, and they were Manos Kazivakis and Mikis Theodorakis. Mikis Theodorakis is more well-known abroad than Manos was. So I was brought up listening to this music, and it was, um, it was just part of my, my musical DNA. And what these composers did that was very characteristic at the time was... Uh, First of all, they were both, in very different ways, but they were both deeply rooted in the tradition of Rebetiko and Laiko. Let's listen to Eli singing a haunting anti-war song by Theodorakis. There's dancing in the flowering gardens with Charos, or death, invited to drink and sing along. Both Theodorakis and Hadzidaikis were titans of Greek 20th century music, but in some ways they were both outsiders. Well, they were outsiders and they were very unique. And what they did was they established a, a category of music which is called endechno, which what I would call popular art song. So what they did, which no other composers had done until then, they took poetry by major Greek poets and set their poetry to music. One of the things that's always struck me amazingly in Greece is that you get this work by major poets, which is then listened to by the common person on the radio who will be singing along to these Nobel Prize winning poems. It's extraordinary, really. I'm not sure where else you get that. It is very unique, I think. Um, of course, Miki had a, it was almost a, a political act in his hands. He very actively did this. Khadzidaki, on the other hand, he was more interested in the poetry, which is also very political. So Khadzidaki went on to write, uh, to record Megalos Erotikos, which was a, a compilation of poetry ranging from Sappho, from antiquity, to modern poetry, including Elitis and Gatsos. It is the monumental tribute to, to love, to Eros, to That was a clip from Magnus Eroticus that Ellie just mentioned, with its amazing range of love poetry. It's interesting that Khadzidaikis was well known as being gay and Theodorakis had his own problems with being a communist <laughs> and was locked up for it. So they both were oppressed in various ways. 
And yet, I think there was was a lot of pressure to oppress them, but they never were oppressed. <laughs> and Khadzidaki would say something very funny. He would say, great artists are either communists or homosexuals, and I am not a communist. <laughs> so it was a very successful comment. And they really, they respected one another. We shouldn't forget that Khadzidaikis also wrote the Oscar-winning song The Kids of Piraeus, Tapedia tu Pirea, for the film Never on Sunday, remember? With Melina Mercuri singing. <laughs> As a parting gift, Ellie sang us a few lines from Persephone's Nightmare, one of her favourite Khadzidaiki songs. Luckily, she wasn't put off by her neighbour's dog. <laughs> To find out more about the poetry side of things, I'm going to call someone who's an expert on the poet Yanis Ritsos and his collaboration with Theodorakis. I first met John Kitmer when he was British ambassador in Athens, the first openly gay one who came with his husband. He then left the diplomatic service to complete a PhD on Ritsus. He's currently writing several books about the poet, and he's chairman of the Anglo-Hellenic League and organises the Runciman Award for a book about Greece in English. John is a true Phil Hellene in the tradition of Byron. Ritsus is considered one of the great poets of the 20th century, but I wanted to know why his poems were used so extensively by Theodorakis for his songs. Well, first and foremost, Theodorakis admired Ritsos's poetry. Um, both men were communists, and as members of the Greek left, they had very similar experiences during the Nazi occupation in the Civil War and during the junta in the 1960s. Both were targets of the state, spending time in prison and on island camps, Both suffered really bad health, not helped by imprisonment. Um, And Theodorakis just looked to some of Ritsos' most important political poems for inspiration, and he found lots of inspiration there. You're currently working on a book of of translations of Ritsos, and they are poems that Theodorakis used. Yes, I'm supporting the great English poet, David Harsant, who's doing the translation. Uh, He's a lifelong fan of Ritsos, and he's writing new versions of the poems that Ritsos wrote first in jail and then under house arrest uh, in the time of the Hunter between 1968 and 1970. Uh, We've just published with Rack Press uh, a collection called Homeland, 18 Bitter Songs, and this is a version of a very famous collection by Ritsos called Deca Octo Leono Trago, that is Picris Patridas. This was a specially commissioned resistance poem for music. In autumn 1968, um, both Theodorakis and Ritsos were in prison in different parts of Greece at the hands of the junta, and Theodorakis managed to get a message to Ritsos saying that he wanted new poetry so that he could set it to music. And he asked for something aplo, uh, kelito, which means something very simple and very austere, and something that expressed the spirit of the time, so a resistance poem. And Ritos, who was really prolific and could concentrate, like very few poets, he sat down and on one day, in September 1968, wrote 16 of the 18 bitter songs, two couplets each. There's huge respect for poets in Greece, and it's hardly surprising given what poets have done. They've often given people a voice in Greece, and they've been a sort of antidote to all the traumas, the poisons of dictatorship and one sort of oppression or another and war. Um, It's quite an incredible thing that Ritsos has done. 
I agree. I mean, I think that if you want to get into modern Greek poetry, particularly the poetry of the 20th century, music is often the best, the best way to do it. For us foreigners who are learning a language, music is the way of capturing often the essence of a sometimes a long poem or a, a series of short poems, as in Homeland. Um, this was certainly the case for me. I was um, coming back with two Cypriot Greek friends from a beach in eastern Attica, uh, one summer's day, we'd had a nice day at the beach, and in the car, in the rusty old jeep that we were in, the radio uh, started to play this incredibly haunting piece by Theodorakis. And because I was learning Greek, I listened to it and I said, but, but this, is, uh, this isn't just soppy song lyrics, this is real poetry, tell me about it. And my, my friends could both sing it, they both knew all of the lyrics, and they said, but this is Ritsos, this is Ritsos set to music by Theodorakis, and it's really important. <laughs> And it was the great um, singer uh, Grigoris Pithikotsis uh, who was interpreting it. I can't now remember whether it was Epitaphios or Romeosini, but it was absolutely fantastic. And I decided there and then that I would first find the pieces that had been set to music and then properly read uh, first Romeosini. So it was really my way into to Greek poetry. And uh, now for 24 years, I've been reading Ritsos. An amazing. And singing. Thing. <laughs> and singing, glad to hear it. And amazing to think of that then following that, years later, you came back to Athens as ambassador. I think I'm one of the, the few diplomats who got into Greek poetry through the music of the communist left. And it was a fantastic <laughs> way into a really important aspect of Greek life. To finish up, John read us the 17th of the 18 bitter songs, first in Greek and then in English translation. It's titled One Thought. Here, now, there is only silence. Birds silent, church bells silent, and this Greek bitter, silent among his silent dead. The wet stone is still. Our blades are dull, but he sharpens his nails to talons and thinks of freedom. influence of Rembetica and at the art songs described by Elie Paspala. Another genre that inspires many musicians is the motica, as in demotic. They're folk songs with roots going back centuries, but they're very much alive today. To find out more, I'm going to talk to Joshua Barley, He's a young British translator and writer living in Athens. He and David Connolly have produced a marvellous collection of poems by Michaelis Ganas, one of the most respected living poets. And he's currently working on a book of Greek folk song lyrics. When not writing, Josh is a guide in northern Greece for the slow cyclist, which is surely what we should all do for our next holiday. I'm curious about why these village songs are so popular in Athens. Well, I think it's because they're the heritage of a lot of people who live in Athens, because a, a huge proportion of the population of Athens comes from villages. And could you explain to me a bit about the significance of these folk songs? Well, actually, to call them folk songs, in a way, doesn't quite capture them, because they're just as much poems as well as songs and they've been considered as as great works of Greek poetry for a long time ever since Greece became a country a nation and this 
attachment to the village, it's not just poets, is it? As you said, it's every other Athenian and... There's a mix. They go back to their villages for holidays, for the summer festivals, and all hell lets loose at the Panigyria. Exactly, yes. I mean, I go down to my, to my bakery or any shop in my, my neighbourhood and, uh, and the people there, uh, they have their identity as Epirotes or whichever other part of Greece. Often it happens to be Epirotes where I live in Athens. This idea of being a foreigner is something that's very strong within the Greek, whether it's somebody who's come from a village or to Athens, or whether it's somebody who's gone abroad somewhere. And that's reflected in these songs. It certainly is. And a large number of songs of a, a particular kind called Tisxenitias, which means, well, it's very hard to translate. It's this concept of being abroad and the songs seek to understand what it means to, to be abroad and to be away from home because it's been such a, an important part of the Greek psyche. You do these cycling tours in Epirus in the summer and I bet you've been to a few panigyria with these kind of songs, the motika. Mm. Can you give me a flavour of what happens? Well, I think what I love about the Panigyria is the, the feeling of, of togetherness. In the dance, you're all in a, in a circle. I'm, that's the sort of classic quintessential Greek dance. But it's doing this for a long period of time with music that rarely stops and being among friends and people you don't see all the time. And you're, you're together for uh, several days of these, these festivals last I think of the wail of the clarinet as being a kind of characteristic thing, but you also get different songs associated with different dances. Absolutely, and I mean, the clarinet plays a, a huge part in uh, the Panigyria, the festivals of, of the mainland. But there, yeah, there are different dances and all have their own you know, uh, particular feeling and identity and... Um, but what I love about them actually is that you don't actually have to be a good dancer. It's actually more just a part of belonging. Anyone can shuffle along. It's uh, very inclusive, isn't yes. it? You get from the yeah. oldest person in the village probably to almost the youngest can, can join in the fun. Yeah. yeah. Just to jump in here. Traditional dancing is popular in Athens these days. My daughters learnt it at school, and my three sisters-in-law gave up Pilates for Greek dance classes, finding it much more fun as exercise. One of my favourites is uh, it's called Yani Muto Mandilisu, uh, which is an old song, but it's still it's played. You know, it's very well known now. You know. On the, go to the beach or wherever, you could play it and everyone would sing along to it. In the translation, it will appear as Yanni's handkerchief. It's all about a handkerchief, which is a very symbolic object in folk tradition in Greece. Because you wipe your face with it, whatever, you know, your tears uh, wept into the handkerchief. You wave it, presumably, as you go off on the boat to far off land. Absolutely, and you, you dance with it as well. You, you hold up the per next person in the line with it in the dance. So this song... I love because it, the words are so fine-tuned, so economically put about the, the condition of being abroad and how you can't sort of shake it, you can't get rid of it. It, it marks you. It goes in English. Oh, Yanni, why is your handkerchief so very soiled and dirty? It's being abroad that soiled it, those wretched foreign lands. I've washed it in five rivers, yes, and they were soiled too. A thousand sheep went by the stream, and they were soiled too. And that's all it is. It's just, you know, two couplets. But it's, uh, it's got a great punch behind those words. One of the things you've introduced me to that I didn't know about before is these fusion bands who are very up-to-the-minute modern, but they refer strongly to these folk, the motika songs, in, in their productions. Yeah, well, I think what's, what's interesting at the moment is that for a while, for a long time, Rebetica was uh, pervasive music in, in Athens and that contributed as well to, into art music, to Endechno. I think there's been a strong interest in, in the clarinet music, the music of the mainland as opposed to the music of the, 
of the island of Asia Minor, Turkey, the Greek part of Turkey. There are several bands and singers and composers who are making use of the clarinet in interesting ways, whether it's combining it with the blues or with rock. Actually, the, harmonically, the scales of epirote music are quite similar to rock and blues, so it works quite well. That was a bluesy interpretation of Yanni's handkerchief by Mukliomos. And to finish, here's another version that's more rock. It's by Vik or Villagers of Ioannina City. This has been a bit of a sprint through music that deserves more time, but we've looked at some of Athens's most loved songs. Non-Greek speakers might not get all the lyrics, but many are poems which have been translated, so there are ways in. Let's go out with a song by Khadzidaikis. It's called Athena, or Athens. In the next episode, we'll dip a toe into the holy waters of Greek orthodoxy, birth, death and life the Athenian way. We'll stroll around the beautiful first cemetery, an urban oasis with some wonderful sculptures and famous tombs. We'll look at why name days are celebrated more than birthdays. And I'll ask my kumbara, my goddaughter's mother, why being a godparent is such a big deal. I am Sofka Zinoviev, and you just listened to Athens Unpacked for This is Athens, the official visitor's guide to the city of Athens, online at thisisathens.org. You can find all episodes of Athens Unpacked on Spotify, Apple Podcasts or any of your favourite podcast apps. Athens Unpacked is a production of pod.gr. Thanks to Katerina Bakoyani for her endless support. Producer, Michalis Kamakas. Sound engineer, Chrisa Kurenda. Director of Productions, Elena Dimitraiki. Assistant producer, Lara Papadimitriou. Original theme music by Anna Papadimitriou. This podcast is funded by Greece and the European Union. Pod.gr. Sounds good.